Ongoing violence in the Middle East. The deadly Ebola virus strikes fear around the United States. And a museum in the University of Pennsylvania rediscovers a 6,500-year-old human skeleton in their own storage room. How does that even happen? This and many other topics from around the world will not be discussed on today's show. Ha ha ha! Let's do this! Laughing with cancer Let's live a life, not just survive Laughing with cancer If you're not laughing, life will pass you by Welcome once again to Laughing with Cancer, show number seven. I'm your host, Elvis Rico, and I hope that you all had a wonderful July and uh, I hope your summer was awesome, and it's time to uh, get those kids back to school. Am I right? Did you have a crazy back to school uh, August? Because I know it was kind of crazy here. We have a uh, a 14 year old going to high school because of course they start high school at ninth grade nowadays. Not like back when we were growing up, right? You started started high school at 10th grade, 10th, 11th, and 12th. There was no promotion, junior high to high school. There was just a, here you go, you're on your way to high school, good luck, don't let the door hit you on the butt on the way out, right? But nowadays they have a promotion, it's almost like a graduation for the kids to go to high school. No, just get your butt to high school and get yourself to the 12th grade and graduate and go to college, right? (laughs) <laughs> so I hope you guys had a wonderful, wonderful day and a wonderful evening, a wonderful morning, a wonderful afternoon, a wonderful whatever time it is that you're listening to this show. Um, we're doing okay over here, kind of. You know what? When I was growing up, I grew up Catholic. And uh, the Padre told me, he said, you know what, young man? You don't change your ways. You're going to spend eternity in hell. Well, guess what there, Mr. Padre? I live in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, that's pretty close to hell as far as the heat goes, because it was 115 the other day, my friends, 100 and melt the other day, and it'll probably get up to 17, 117 before it's all over and done with. I think the hottest it's been around here is 121. I'm not sure when that was or how long ago that was, probably last year for all I know, but it was hot. It was hot. And uh, why I live here, I have no idea. Because it's better than New Mexico, is all I can say. And for those of you that live in New Mexico, I'm glad you enjoy it. Because I do not. (laughs) Anyways, like I said, welcome to Laughing with Cancer. And like I said at the beginning, we will not be talking about Israel and Hamas and that craziness in the Middle East. We will not be talking about that. No, 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 no. We will not be talking about the Ebola virus. Whew, that everybody's scared. We're going to have an outbreak. Nah. We got enough outbreak of cancer, right? Am I right? So, we won't be talking about that. And uh, But as far as the University of Pennsylvania, how do you not know there's a 6,500-year-old skeleton in your closet, in your storage room? What other skeletons are in your closet there, University of Pennsylvania? Huh? (laughs) Oh my goodness. That's just, how does that even happen? I mean, you would think you're in a museum. Don't you label things? No, you just put it in the closet, put it in the storage room, opened up the door one day and then shin shin bone fell out. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know how that happens, but we won't be discussing that. No, 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 no. What we will be discussing, my friends, is... Of course, cancer, right? The dreaded C word. Oh my goodness. Um, the very first show that I did, I talked about being diagnosed with cancer and uh, what I went through and, and uh, how I felt and, and stuff like that. But what I didn't talk about was how I was told. How did the doctor go about telling me? And so we're going to talk a little bit about bedside manner today. We're going to talk a little bit about how the doctor treated you when uh, when he told you that you have the dreaded C word, right? When you have cancer. Ooh. Nobody likes to hear that word. Nobody. 
It doesn't matter what kind of cancer you have. Nobody likes to hear the word, you have cancer. So, how do we go about, you know, dealing with that when the doctor tells you that? Or how does the doctor go about dealing with that when he tells you that you have cancer? So that's what we're going to talk about a little today. And uh, hopefully we'll get a perspective from people's point of view of how they were dealt with it. And maybe uh, try to understand a little bit about the doctor's point of view. Because, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of them have so much to deal with as far as patients go. You know, they don't know how to deal with, with telling somebody they have cancer. And others, well, they get a little too concerned with their patients. What is the definition of bedside manner, right? Well, bedside manner refers to most often to the way a medical professional interacts and communicates with the patient. Sometimes the term is used to in a positive way only. You know, a doctor with a bedside manner is a good communicator, while one without one may offend or may be, uh, be overall abrupt with patients. So the term can be described as good or bad. A good bedside manner might be, you know, might be something that includes showing uh, empathy, being open to communication, involved with the patient in health decisions, and helping the patient feel at ease. A poor one can manifest in arrogance, failure to listen to a patient, abruptness, dismissal of the patient's fears and rudeness. Uh, kind of, <laughs> kind of like Dr. House on TV. You guys ever watch that show House? Now, that dude was a total jerk, right? But he was smart. So maybe he thinks, you know, because he thinks he's so smart, he's allowed to be rude and crude to people. So that would be an example of a bad bedside manner is Dr. House on TV. An example of a good bedside manner would be anybody <laughs> other than Dr. House, I would guess. That would be an example of, of a good bedside manner. Now, when I was told that I had cancer, I, I basically was going in for a physical because I had pains in my legs. And my aunt had died of a massive heart attack. And uh, my cousin had told me that she was complaining of pains in her leg before she had a massive heart attack. So I figured, hey, I better go check my ticker out. You know what I mean? And uh, so I went in there and I... You know, did the physical and had my blood drawn and all that stuff and um, asked the nurse, you know, when will I ha have the results of my blood work? And she says, ah, don't worry about it. You know, three, four days. If anything, you know, sooner, we'll call you right away. So I was on my way home from the doctor's office and uh, I got a call from the doctor. And all he said was, uh, Mr. Ochoa, you, uh, you have an appointment with an oncologist tomorrow morning. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, wait a minute. What does that mean? Well, your blood work came back and we, you have an appointment with the oncologist. I was like, hey, what does that mean? He goes, well, you, the, the oncologist. I said, wait a minute. Oncologist. I don't even know what an oncologist is. <laughs> I didn't know what an oncologist was. I had no clue. You know, I said, well, wait, wait, huh? He goes, well, your, your white count came back high. So we have an appointment with the oncologist. I said, it still doesn't explain. What an oncologist is? What are you talking about? And he's like, well, I'd, I'd rather not say over the phone, you know. And I was like, hey, how about I'd rather you tell me now what the hell you're talking about? Because I'm starting to get upset. He goes, okay, okay. Normally, a high white count means you have uh, leukemia. And then I was like, oh, okay. So I'm guessing uh, uh, you're saying I have cancer? <laughs> he goes, well, we have an appointment. I'm not saying that you do or you don't. I'm just saying that you have an appointment with an oncologist tomorrow and uh, you can take, we'll take it from there. I was like, okay, so, all right. Well then, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry I was uh, rude and uh, a little loud, but uh, thank you. And uh, I guess I will see the oncologist tomorrow. <laughs> so, you know, so my, my experience with being told that I had cancer kind of was, uh, over the phone, and I'm sure a lot of them, a lot of the doctors don't want to tell you something like you have cancer over the phone. They'd rather tell you in person. But I was pretty, pretty, uh, I, I wouldn't say rude. I guess I'd say abrupt about wanting to know what he was talking about. Because like I said, I had no idea. What's an oncologist? 
Okay, I know that's a specialist in something. So, I, uh, cancer doctor. So, I wanted to know from others how they were told that they had cancer. How they, how, how was your experience with the, the bedside manner? Was it good? Was it bad? And uh, there was a few of you that emailed me and a few that messaged me on Facebook. Uh, David Flyne, he says, uh, my first hint came from my internal medicine doctor. He had done testing after I contacted him about fatigue. The next day I met my first oncologist. He is awesome. Well, that's awesome, David. I'm glad you're, you uh, get along with your doctor. Some of us out there don't get along with our doctor. Some of us do. Um, Sarah King messaged me also. She said, the doctor at the ER, he just kind of spat it out during conversation. I looked at him and said, excuse me? He has what? Yeah, sometimes the doctors really don't know how to tell you. They just kind of go, uh, well, um, I, uh, I got you this peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But see, what happened was we accidentally got this mayonnaise on there, and but we scraped it off. Okay, we kind of, we scraped it off, and it's all good. Peanut butter and jelly is back to peanut butter and jelly, and it's all good. So uh, go ahead and uh, take that peanut butter and jelly, and uh, we'll uh, talk to you uh, in about three months. See how that peanut butter jelly sandwich was. <laughs> but, you know, you can't always though, blame the doctors for their bedside manner sometimes. Because, you know, the doctors, you have to understand the doctors are people. You know, they're regular people. Sometimes we put them up on pedestals. But we have to understand that they are just regular people, just like us. You know, you have to you have to remember his, his point of view. You know, he has insurance constraints you know a waiting room full of patients he has uh, the rent and the power bills due in the office space and uh, he promised his daughter he'd be at their first uh, at her first uh, soccer game after school you know maybe his kid got busted for smoking pot at high school or something like that you know every they everybody has problems man everybody is human and everybody has to deal with issues the same way and uh, maybe he got into an argument with his wife the point is, the doctors are people too, is what I'm saying. They have similar frustrations to yours and mine. And that's why some doctors, particularly specialists, they learn to distance themselves on purpose. Imagine going to work every day knowing someone you have treated, perhaps for a long time, will die despite your best efforts. Or uh, watching a patient get sicker because they didn't follow treatment instructions or any number of frustrations beyond your control. Distance creates a buffer that protects them from emotional stress, for them getting too emotionally attached to their patients, because they have so many patients. Like I said, some of them, it's like a drive through window, in and out, in and out. You know, next, next, you have cancer, next, we, chemotherapy, next, radiation for you, next. You know, I don't... I don't see how they can see so many, so many patients and the insurance restricts them for how much time they can spend with each patient before they end up losing money, you know, with their business because they're spending too much time on one certain patient or else they have to go and, uh, and make shortcuts so that they, you know, see more patients in less time in order to follow those insurance guidelines type nonsense. The doctors are people too, is what I'm tr basically trying to say. <laughs> and you know what? Patients can be a little bit hard to get along with. I know, <laughs> I know, um, um, whenever I was going through my cancer and all my issues and stuff like that, I came in with one of my appointments. I had a tattoo. I just got a tattoo. And my doctor was mad. He was pissed. He, he started lecturing me for like 15 minutes, if not longer. Well, at least it felt, it was probably five minutes, but it felt like 15 minutes. It felt like forever. But he's lecturing me about, you can't be doing this and you can't be doing that. You have a blood disorder. Do you understand what, if you used to get an infection from the tattoo, because your body, your immune system's already compromised, you cannot be doing these things and getting tattoos. That's like, okay, doc, I get it. I understand. I totally understand. And, uh, so he says, okay, well, I'm glad we understand each other. So I will see you again in three months and uh, we'll go from there. I said, all right, okay. Three months came, I went in, I had my whole arm tattooed. And <laughs> on my inside of my forearm, I have, I have leukemia. Leukemia don't have me. 
<laughs> Nobody's going to tell me what I can or can't do. I was kind of mad at everybody, mad at the world, mad, mad at this and that. So, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> we'll get into that at another time when I talk about my tattoos and why I got all my tattoos. And it has to do with the podcast called Keith and the Girl. But we'll get into that in another show when I talk about all my tattoos. Um, Kevin uh, Feeney, he writes me and says, uh, when, when the doctor told me I had CLL, he just stated it straight out. You have leukemia. And then I knew that I had to learn how to spell it correctly from then on. <laughs> That's funny because, you know what, to this day, I would always, I mean, I know how to spell leukemia. But I will catch myself looking at my forearm to make sure I spelt leukemia right if I have to put it down on something. And I know how to spell it. I just, it's a habit. I look at my arm and say, oh, leukemia. Yep, I spelt it right. <laughs> I have another story from Jennifer McIntosh. I believe she's a fellow Keith and the Girl listener. I believe so. I might be wrong. But uh, she writes me and says, I was at the ENT for a follow-up on a healing of my tonsils. Right before he shoved the tube up my nose to check the, on the healing, he tells me, we found cancer on your thyroid, so we're going to have to take out the other thyroid, and you will have to undergo treatment. He was completely bewildered by my reaction, which was crying, freaking out, and asking him all kinds of questions. His first response was, it's the least lethal form of cancer. It is the easiest to treat and the type of cancer anyone would rather be diagnosed with. <laughs> to which I responded, I've had an effing rough summer. <laughs> Can I get an effing moment? You just told me I had effing cancer. He spent the next few minutes trying to get me to calm down so he could shove the tube down my nose. Worst bedside manner ever. Well, Jennifer, I am so sorry you had to go through that. And I am glad that everything worked out and they were able to treat you and take care of you. And uh, that does sound like, you know, some bad bedside manner. It's like I said, sometimes the doctors, they just, they don't understand that the word cancer can just scare the crap out of anybody. Just scare the living tar out of anybody. It doesn't matter if it's the easiest kind of cancer to treat. For one, they're going to be removing something from your body. You're going to have to undergo some type of treatment. There's all kinds of stuff that could go wrong. You never know. Just the word cancer can scare the crap out of anybody. But like I said, you know, not all doctors are unsympathetic towards you when they have to tell you you have cancer, no matter what kind of cancer it is. There's some that are very sympathetic and uh, feel real bad. As a matter of fact, Nicole Eisenberger uh, messaged me and she said, When I was recently diagnosed with oral cancer, I'm under 40 and don't fit all the normal markers of getting cancer. I had been referred to an ENT specialist for a biopsy. When he found out the results, he immediately called our local cancer center and had a surgeon squeeze an appointment in for me later that week. My ENT wanted to make sure he had contacted me before the cancer center to make sure I heard the news from him before they told me about my appointment. I was out of town for a business meeting, so I missed his call. I have a difficult last name, so when I returned my ENT's call, there was some confusion, and we laughed and joked about it. Immediately after us laughing, he made a deep sigh, and I knew the results without him having to say another word. He was so sad and apologetic that I had to learn over the phone, but he needed to rush everything through so there wasn't time to get me into his office to do it in person. And I found myself comforting him. Then she goes on to say, what the heck was I doing? I'm the one with the cancer and here I am comforting the doctor because he feels so, so bad about having to tell me. He was a very sweet and kind guy, so I really did feel bad at how upset he was to give me the news. He was just one of those oddly uh, comical situations. Well, Nicole, I am so glad you were able to find some type of humor in that situation because I'm sure it was very devastating to get the news. And uh, I'm glad your doctor was very sympathetic toward you. Um, like I said, doctors are human and uh, they do feel for their patients. A lot of them do feel for their patients. Sometimes you can just get thrown into a big tornado of all kinds of things. And you have no idea what just happened to your world. It just got flipped upside down. And you're like, what? Huh? What? Huh? 
For example, uh, Teresa Stiles messaged me. She says, my husband was told on the phone. They called and said, we want you to pack a suitcase. We're transporting you to a hospital four hours away in an hour. We had no clue what that even meant. We were there for 10 weeks the first time. So yeah, that could be kind of crazy. Just get a call out of the blue saying, hey, pack your bags. We're sending you to the hospital and uh, we're going to fly you there ASAP. Well, I hope they sent you a limo because you get news like that and you have no idea what is happening. I sure hope they weren't expecting you to drive to the airport. You know what I mean? So yeah, a lot of times they'll just send you to the hospital and you'll have no clue and you're driving all the way to the hospital thinking, what could it possibly be? What could I, I know I did blood work. I know I did uh, physical. Uh, why would they be calling me? <laughs> you know, so uh, Susan Hunt also messaged me. She said it was very scary for her daughter. Uh, she was ill and then they took her to into her PCP. Uh, she did blood work. They got a call an hour later telling her to go to the oncologist unit at the hospital and they would meet her there or meet them there at the hospital. That is where they told us. So, yeah, they just they don't tell you, uh, you know, we got some news from your results. We got some news from this and that. They just say, listen, uh, you need to go to the hospital. We need to we'll meet you there and we'll discuss what's going on there. And then they expect you to just drive over there. I don't I don't understand <laughs> you know that's your brain is spinning a thousand times a minute right you know just going round and round and round and round and round what could possibly be going on what could it possibly mean that they need me to go there right away yeah so throwing you out there like that you know without any idea what just happened to your world all you know is that something is wrong can be a little crazy a lot of the messages and the and the emails that I got were uh a lot of them were positive, not too many negative on a bedside manner, but I want to thank everybody who, uh, who messaged me, who emailed me and who shared their story about being told they had cancer. And, uh, thank you for letting me jabber to you guys. I want you guys to remember to, uh, just try and try and stay positive. Try to, uh, not let the situation depress you too much because it can be very depressing. And it can continue to be very depressing no matter how much, how many times you fall and you get back up and you fall and you get back up. You know, after a while, you just, that fatigue will get to you and you just get depressed again. I find myself sometimes getting depressed again and uh, having to pull myself back up. But uh, it happens. And um, especially when you're told you have cancer. Uh, those, those emotions that I talked to about, that I talked about in my first show, they, uh, they go through you. They go through you and they continue to go through you as you uh, go through this, this journey of cancer. And always remember the great phrase by the Italian stallion Rocky Balboa. And he says, it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. <laughs> that's my that's my best uh, Stallone impression I think I could do. But uh, yeah, you know what it is. It's about it's not about how hard you hit. It's about it's about being able to get up and hitting back and moving forward. You know. So always remember that. Uh, thank you there, uh, Stallone, for that uh, that little quote. <laughs> hey, I want to remind you guys that uh, November seventh is the light the night walk here in Phoenix. It's uh, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, Society, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, and uh, we're taking donations to uh, help cure leukemia and lymphoma. And I know it's not the ice bucket challenge for the ALS, but it is for a good cause, and uh, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society would really appreciate your donation. So um, I want you guys to go to my website. It's uh, laughingwithcancerpodcast.com. And on there is a link. You can go there and you guys can donate to uh, help for the Light the Night Walk. But uh, yeah, you guys are probably wondering, where can we find Elvis? Where can we find Laughing With Cancer? You can find me on Stitcher. You can find me on podcastland.com. You can uh, find me on Twitter, Laugh with Cancer. Uh, you can find me anywhere. Google Laughing with Cancer. And there I am, my friends. I'm all over the place. So, yes, I want to thank you guys. 
for joining me. Thank you guys for letting me jabber to you. And uh, we'll see you next time. Or I don't know if we'll see you. But you'll hear me next time on Laughing with Cancer. So remember, my friends, if you're not laughing, you're not living. Peace, love, and stay laughing. Laughing with Cancer Podcast.com